Hi there, welcome to Nepi Invest. Time for a bit of an update to Tesserant, focusing primarily on their September quarter results. It was interesting results, particularly compared to the June quarter. And I'll discuss why these two quarters, if uh, compared side by side, do look quite interesting. And right now, the share price of Tesserant is dropping. It's fallen through a pretty strong support level at 10 cents and has stayed below 10 cents for a few weeks now and is currently at 9.6 cents. Before we have a look at the September core results for Tesserant and some other stuff as well, uh, just a few facts in regards to this business. This is a cybersecurity and secure cloud services company. This company, or well, Tesserant, has been quite acquisitive over the past few years, and you'll be able to see the effect of that, those or those that those um, acquisitions when we look at the revenue growth of this company, but also the shares on issue growth as well, because to make these acquisitions, this company issues, issues more shares. And the big question I have for Tesrant and this business model they have developed is whether they have created any value for their shareholders. Tesserant was founded in 2015 and listed on the ASX in February 2016. So that means they've nearly been on the ASX for about seven years. The current CEO is Kurt Hansen, and the large shareholder is actually Jeff Lord, who is their big gravier founder and CEO. He has 8% holding in this company. Now, back in May, I did a video and the market cap of Tesserant back then was $208 million. That was at a share price of 16 and a half cents. And the current market cap of this company is around about 130 million. That's at a share price of 9.7 cents. I am recording this video just after trading has been completed for the day and the share price for Tesserant did end up at 9.6 cents. And the T code for Tesserant is one of the most explosive T codes on the ASX. T and T. Before we have a look at the September core results for financial year 23, let's just have a look at how Tesserant performed in financial year 22. So we'll look at the numbers in this slide, and then we'll also have a look at some financial statements. Now, if you just looked at revenue growth, you might be happy with Tesserant if you ignored the share price action, that is, because revenue is growing at a pretty good rate. In fact, Revenue grew from 67.4 million to 113 million. Now, a lot of that revenue growth is because of acquisitions. And for companies like Tesla, I think, in my opinion, it's very important not just to look at revenue growth, but look at revenue per share growth, because shares on issue for this company have been increasing at quite a quick rate over the past four or five years. Gross margins, quite good at 88%, but of course, um, with high staff costs and things like that, operating margins are considerably lower than the gross margin. So you also have to look at operating margins, net margins for companies like this as well. Now, there is a big discrepancy between operating cash flow and profit. Most of the times I do pay closer attention to operating cash flow. And for Tazra, it does $11.8 million in financial year 22, increasing from $2.9 million in the previous year. But if you look at profit, this company was loss making the tune of $8.8 .8 million, which is significantly uh, lower or different than the operating cash flow. So I'm going to explore why there's a big discrepancy between operating cash flow and profit. And even last year, this company was uh, loss making by $4.5 million. So there is some reason there why this company can't translate this increasing revenue, these margins, this operating cash flow, even free cash flow into profit. The company also has debt. There's one concern I do have about Tesserant, and I'll talk about why is their debt. Now, it's not a big concern, but they are or have net debt of $21 million at the end of financial year 22. Some of the valuation metrics do seem low. Price to sales ratio, 1.2, and price to operating cash flow fairly low for this company as well at 11.1. I'm just going to look at a couple of uh, financial statements in their uh, financial results. Now, 
I'm not going to look at the um, cash flow statement. Instead, I'm going to look at note eight, which is the reconciliation of loss after income tax to net cash from our operating activities, because this gives us uh, an idea on why there's a discrepancy between operating cash flow and profit. In fact, it gives us the whole reason, because in this particular reconciliation, the company starts at the loss of $8.8 .8 million and then work away backward to get to that operating cash flow of $11.8 .8 million. So the first thing there is, is depreciation amortization, $7.8 million. But this company also had an impairment of $1 million, share-based payments of $2.4 million, other expenses, non-cash, $1.2 million, and a really high finance cost, non-cash finance cost of $9.4 million. And that is one of the main reasons why there is a discrepancy between uh, profit and operating cash flow for Tesla. Also have a look at changes in working capital, which is changes in receivables, changes in inventories, which is nothing, changes in contract assets, and also changes in trade payables. But the main reason there is a big difference between profit and operating cash flow for Tesla is around appreciation, amortization, and that non-cash finance costs. For those who don't know, usually when I see a company release a financial report, I start with the operating cash flow, not the operating cash flow, the cash flow statement, and then work my way backwards. This is what I've been doing for the last 10 to 15 years. There's no reason you have to do it that way. That's just the way I do it. I like to start with the cash flow statement, go to the balance sheet, and then have a look at the P&L statement. And then I'll go through notes. I think going through notes is very important. And I probably would assume not many investors would go through the notes. and you get the reconciliation in the notes. But to get a bit of a clue what that non-cash finance cost is, I go to the P&L statement. And in the P&L statement, uh, down the bottom here in expenses, we have a few interesting lines just below the appreciation amortization expense of 7.8 million. So we have finance costs, 5.4 million, impairment of financial instruments, $4.3 million, Share of loss of equity accounted associates, 322000 And then just below that, debt facility unamortized warrants write-off expense, $7.5 million. And then a debt facility exit fee, $1.8 million. So the majority of expenses and the reasons why there's a discrepancy between the profit for this company and the operating cash flow is around these finance costs. In fact, they amount to well over $10 million. In fact, almost, we'll say almost $17 million in fact. So if they didn't have these finance costs, this company would have been highly profitable in financial year 22. Before we have a look at the September quarter results or pennies for C4 financial year 23, let's just go back one year just to see how this company has progressed over the past year. We assessed the customers $40 million and the company was operating cash flow positive by a small amount, but it is positive $606,000. The one thing you will notice if you do have a look at this particular Appendix 4C is this company did spend a lot of money or lose a lot of money in investing and financing activities. And that meant the cash on hand actually fell by $6.8 million, down from $14.9 million to $8.1 million. One of the reasons behind that is deferred settlements of five. $6 million. But receipts were up $6.5 million from the previous September quarter in financial year 21, which is not a surprise because this company is quite acquisitive and we have seen receipts and revenue rise quite aggressively over the past few years because of those acquisitions. And now on to the September quarter for financial year 23, just to see how this company has progressed. If you just focused on receipts, you'd be loving the story because the receipts grew by level, rose by $11.8 million. Unfortunately, the expenses or the costs increased at a greater rate than the receipts. And that's why the company was operating cash flow negative by $2.1 million. Now, one thing I should mention, and I very rarely mention this in these uh, Appendix 4C or 5B videos, is if you just looked at the statement of cash flows, and from operating activities, you don't really see any changes or any significant changes in working capital. And there is a reason I'm talking about this right now, and we'll get to that later in the video. But this company was operating cash flow negative by $2.1 million. And because they also keep on spending money in financing, 
and what's the other one? Financing investing activities. Their cash on hand fell again from 14.3 million to 9.5 million. This company saw a significant rise in product manufacturing and operating costs. That that those costs were up $8.4 million. Staff costs were also up $6.2 million, but administration costs only up $100,000. They also spent $842,000 on capital expenditure, $5.6 million on deferred settlement, but received $2.7 million in options and increased their borrowings by $1.4 million. One section of the Appendix 4C or 5B I always transition to or look at is Section 7 financing facilities, because in this section, we get an idea on how much debt one of these companies have. And I think it's very important to know the debt levels of a company. And even more importantly, it's important to know the particulars of the financing facilities a company might have. Now, Tesrin has been in debt for a while. They have used debt just like they have um, issued shares to make all these acquisitions they have made. At this point in time, they are in debt to the tune of $37 million. They also have unused financing of $22 million. So, so they could actually use that $22 million to make more acquisitions, or they could use that $22 million for working capital changes, stuff like that. Now, it's very important also to know that Tesla changed their, the provider of their financing facilities in June. Now, their old provider was uh, Pure Asset Management, and the interest rates on those facilities were 8.5% and 8.9%. With CBA, it's market rate. So at this point in time, I would probably say the market rate is a little bit lower than 85 to 8.9%. So the interest they are paying on their financing is lower than it used to be with Pure Asset Management, and that's a good thing moving forward for this company. But I will continue to pay close attention to the debt levels for Tesla. We don't want to see debt blowing out too much for this company because in the long run, the main reason small cap companies go bankrupt is because of debt. The last time I did a video on Tesla, they were operating cash flow positive by $11.1 million. This was in the June quarter, the previous quarter to the current quarter. Now, the management of the company wanted to put a lid on the enthusiasm or the hype um, around the company being operating cash flow by a fairly large amount. And they, they mentioned here there was favorable movements in net working capital. So changes in working capital that led to this favorable operating cash flow number. But they also mentioned here that favorable operating cash flow was expected to continue into the first quarter of financial year 23 as work in progress balance built from consulting activity in quarter three and quarter four unwinds to normal levels. So it didn't quite happen like that. So I wouldn't call wouldn't call a company being operating cash flow negative by over $2 million to be favorable operating cash flow. So the management was a little bit wrong in the commentary in the previous quarter. But management did explain why Tesla was operating cash flow negative in the September quarter, even though they sort of hinted that it shouldn't be like this in the previous quarter. So they did have an operating cash outflow of $2.1 million as a result of movements in net working capital. Again, changes in working capital is something you don't see in the appendix 4C unless the company explains it or mentions it, mentions it in the commentary. And that changes in working capital included net pay down of creditors of $9.6 million from the fourth quarter of financial year 22. And as noted in previous quarterly releases, seasonality in works in progress and working capital movements over the year have a material impact on the quarterly operating cash flow results. That's probably true for a lot of companies. You will see significant changes in working capital movements uh, from quarter to quarter. So some might argue that releasing quarterly results is not beneficial to shareholders when you do have these large swings in working capital changes. Now to the receipts history for Tesla, and this is where it gets a little bit exciting. I love this particular chart because receipts growth for Tesla have been quite extraordinary over the past two and a half, almost three years. Now Tesla didn't start off as this company that was acquiring a lot of other companies. They had their own business model. They wanted to grow organically. And that business model wasn't really working because the first quarter, 
uh, they had operating cash flow or cash receipts of $1.3 million. That was in the March quarter 2016. And then in the June quarter 2019, they had uh, receipts of $1.3 million. So for a three-year period, receipts went nowhere. And then the management of this company decided to change their tact, change their business model. They became acquisitive, started to acquire companies. And that's why receipts have grown from $1.3 million in the June quarter 2019 to $51.8 million in the September quarter we just saw. One of the big questions I have for Tezzerant and their management is around whether they have created value for their shareholders using this new business strategy that they developed about three or four years ago. So what I'm doing now is comparing the shares, share price, and markup of Tezzerant from when they list on the ASX back in, wasn't it 2016, to right now. Now, because this company has acquired a lot of businesses and they've issued a lot of shares, the shares on issue for Tezzerant have increased by 13-fold from $102 million to $1.35 billion. And even though the markup of this company has increased from $21 million to $131 million, that's only a six-fold increase in valuation. So you have shares on issue increasing by 13 times and the market cap only increasing by six times. That means the share price has halved from when this company listed. So it's decreased from 20 cents to 9.7 cents. So it's a definite question shareholders have to ask management. Has this or is this business strategy creating value for shareholders right now? We need to see and the shareholders need to see a substantial increase in share price to for them to satisfactorily say that this business model has created value for them. Now, in saying that, that is comparing uh, Tezzerant from when they listed to right now. There was a period of time in 2020 and 2021 where this business strategy did create value for shareholders. So this is the weekly chart for Tezzerant going back to when they listed on the ASX in 2016. And the initial business model just wasn't working because the share price fell from 20 cents all the way down to a low of 2.5 cents during the COVID-19 financial panic. And then during 2020, after March 2020 into 2021, there was a lot of excitement behind this company. And the share price actually increased from 2.5 cents to a high of 44 cents. So a share price of 44 cents, this company, the management and this business model had created value for shareholders. Unfortunately, from that high in the share price, which was at the start of 2021, the share price has been consistently fallen, falling. So it has fallen from 44 cents to a current share price of 9.6 cents. And if we have a look at the daily chart going back to the end of 2020, the share price is in a well-defined downtrend. There is nothing stopping the share price from falling. There was a nice, really strong support level at 10 cents. 10 cents and even round numbers tend to be fairly strong support level, particularly 10 cents, $1, $10. And for Tezzerant, uh, for Tezzerant 10 cents remains strong from June all the way through to the end of November, then unfortunately, the share price has fallen through that support level. And that means that 10 cent level is now resistance and does seem like there could be more to fall for this company. So a well-defined downtrend for Tezzerant. Share price keeps on falling. The thing I'd be waiting out for Tezzerant is a shift in sentiment. And the best way to get a shift in sentiment is some really good positive financial news. So this company can continue to release some quarters that are operating cash flow positive. It doesn't have to be $10 million. It just has to be consistently positive by $5 million, $6 million, $7 million, or even more, maybe even less, and also release a half year or yearly report that they are profitable, even significantly profitable. And if the market sees it, we might see a shift in sentiment for this company and then a change in the trend of the share price. Up until then, I have no idea how much further the share price can fall from here. So there's no more point, there's no point trying to assume or guess the low in the share price. Just use the technicals to see when the shift in sentiment happens, when the shift in the trend of the share price happens. And hopefully, again, as I said, that shift in trend 
in the share price and the shift in sentiment can correspond to the release of really good financial news from the company. That's all I have for this December 2022 update for Tezret. If you have any questions about this company or maybe any other company on the ASX, if you think I am wrong in anything I have said, I'd love to hear your opinion. So leave that in the comment section of this video. Otherwise, I'm not a financial advisor. If you do need financial advice, make sure you seek out someone who is qualified and can speak to your own financial needs. That's it for this video. Have a good day. Bye.